Clerk, call the roll. Glenn Whitley, County Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Commissioner of Precinct 1. Devin Allen, Commissioner of Precinct 2. Here. Gary Dickens, Commissioner of Precinct 3. Here. J.D. Johnson, Commissioner of Precinct 4. Here. Constitution Quorum. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by Pastor Tim Stevens from the Azel First Assembly of God Church in Azel, Texas. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledge. Thank you very much for coming out today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I humbly bow before you. And I thank you so much for all your many blessings upon each and every one of us, our families. Thank you for your blessings upon this great country, the great state of Texas, and this great city of Fort Worth. Lord, we are so grateful for who you are and for what you provide for us each and every day. Lord, the freedoms that you've given us, we are so thankful for. And we're thankful that you also implore us to come before you, to approach the throne of grace with boldness. And so we do that today. Lord, while humbly, we also come before you boldly and ask for some things today that you do in great power as only you can do. Lord, we ask for your continued grace and mercy upon us. We ask for wisdom today. And Father, I pray blessing upon each and every person in this place, in this courtroom today, that whatever decisions are made, whatever discussions ensue, that you would superintend every one. And that, Lord, everything that is said and done in this place today would bring you glory and bring you honor. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one, one and indivisible. Thank you again for coming out. Thank you. Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of court, just an announcement. It doesn't deal with today's agenda, but um, we're in that season again. And so next week... And Monday, oh, yeah, no, well, it's almost, but it's not quite. <laughs> um, we begin our budget hearings. And so we will be meeting here beginning at 9 o'clock uh, to do in our budget workshop. And so if you'll just simply mark your calendars. Thank you, Your Honor. Court members, you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of July the 23rd. Move approval. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Um, Commissioner Allen, I believe you have a couple of uh, congratulatory and certificates to present. I do. I have a resolution that I am presenting on behalf of Commissioner Brooks for the Benbrook Middle High School Baseball Program. Um, let's see. I know we have, I believe we have Richard Penland, the principal at Benbrook Middle School, Justin Chavez, the Benbrook baseball team coach, and the members of the Benbrook baseball team. So I'm going to read the resolution into the record, and you all can go ahead and make your way to the podium. Come on down. <laughs> Whereas, Mr. may want to move his podium. Oh, yeah. If you could, Mr. Manius, help us out. Thank you. Whereas the Benbrook Middle High School baseball program compiled an overall record in 2019 with 28 wins, 7 losses, and 2 ties, culminating in a regional finals appearance and earned runner-up in Region 2 Class 4A. And whereas the Benbrook Middle High School baseball program has advanced to the playoffs in each of the three seasons since playing a varsity schedule and compiled a total of 56 wins in the first three years of varsity play. And whereas the Benbrook Middle High School baseball program is one of only eight finalists in the state of Texas Class 4A division and is ranked number eight out of 189 Class 4A teams. And whereas the Benbrook Middle High School baseball program continues to promote the hometown spirit of the Benbrook community while building high expectations for the future of Tarrant County. And whereas the Benbrook Middle High School baseball program recognizes the need to encourage sports in our community, understands its role in raising the standards of youth sports, and takes steps where possible to enhance it. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby congratulate the Benbrook Middle High School Baseball Program for demonstrating the fundamentals of sportsmanship, teamwork,
character, and leadership, and for promoting self-respect through a comprehensive sports program in, in the Tarrant County community. In witness whereof, we have here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 30th day of July 2019. And with that, I move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And then I will come down and present this to you all and if um, Coach Chavez is here, the principal would like to make a few remarks afterwards. Now y'all kind of come in here and face them. We don't want them to get, we don't want them to get a picture of your best side. You guys that are vertically challenged, you know who you are, get in the front. <laughs> I think they were painting. Is, is that? Are you one of those people that are? This is good because they don't see us back here behind you. That means she's going to take three pictures. So you got to wait for three flashes. Sir, thank you for having us this evening, this uh, uh, this morning. My name is Justin Chavez. I am the head baseball coach of uh, Benbrook High School, and we just want to thank you very much for honoring us for our accomplishments. Uh, it wasn't easy, uh, but it's it's a credit to those guys over there. While they are on the uh, baseball field, the entire team does maintain a, a GPA average of over 3.5 as a, a cumulative team as well. So. And we also had um, four, is it four, is that correct, Mr. Benton? Is it, we had four seniors that were also uh, nominated to the All Academic All State team as well this past week, so we'd like to honor them as well. Uh, Xander Carrasco, Davis Benton, uh, Kyle Gimmerin, and Gabe Washington are those kids. So if they are up. here, please stand. Here, stand up. Those, those guys have to maintain a 92 or above in every class so to get that accomplishment. So once again, we just want to thank you for having us and uh, allowing us to, to be a part of this. Uh, these kids work very hard. We are truly blessed to have each and every one of them without, um, obviously, their talent. Um, of course, none of this would be possible. And they have great parents as well that do a really good job with those guys. So we definitely want to thank them. And um, our athletic director, Todd Vesley is here this morning as well, as is Mr. Penland. And uh, without those guys, this wouldn't be possible either, so we'd like to thank them as well. I did not understand that y'all had to travel a little ways to practice every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, These sir. guys became real close. They got do all, you got to do all that homework. The four of them there, they tutored the rest of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and while you were going to practice? Tell absolutely. us a little bit about Absolutely. We, we made that um, our motivation for the year, honestly. Uh, we didn't let that get in our way. And uh, we, we took it out on, I guess if you want to say, we took it out on our opponents for the for the most part throughout the season. And, Explain uh, everybody that was, what happened. What? So when the when the um, when the high school was established, it was established without um, all of the facilities, and so we have to travel roughly 20 to 25 minutes, depending on traffic, uh, on, a, on a daily basis to our home field, which is Goldstein Field, which is next to Clark Stadium, or Wilkerson Grinds Athletic Center. And so we travel on a daily basis with 50 kids, two buses, and we practice three teams on one field uh, for roughly an hour and a half to two hours. We get the most that we can. Obviously, we don't want them to be out there. They're already gone long enough. So we get home in a timely manner. And, uh, you know, we told them whatever we get in, we get in. And, and uh, we're not going to let that be an excuse as to why we can't be good. And we're going to show everybody how good we are. And we, I think we did that. And that was the senior, the senior class's uh, motivation to, 
you know, get as far as we could. We thought we could get three rounds, and we ended up going five rounds deep, which is a true um, accomplishment for these boys, and they were super excited. We played up until the last day of school, so it made the school year go by a little bit faster uh, for those guys. But uh, they also got to play at some nice venues um, throughout the playoffs, and just a great ride, and it's, and it's a great opportunity for these guys to get together one last time and take a group picture and um, just enjoy what they did throughout the season. Good job. Thank you very much. Good job, Mr. Allen, I believe you have some certificates of recognition. I do. Um, I'm honored this morning to be joined by five students from Bowie High School in Arlington ISD who have worked together with our public health department to compete at the Medical Reserve Corps Health Occupation Students of America International Competition. Their team bought, brought home the bronze medal out of over 100 teams. So I know that we have Monica Tipton, who is the MRC Volunteer Coordinator with Tarrant County Public Health. Um, Monica, if you could join us here and give us a little bit more information about what the program is, and then I will present the certificates to the students. Good morning. Um, so the HOSA is for students that are enrolled in Tarrant County Schools, or any school actually throughout the United States. And these students are interested in going to some part of the medical field. Now, that's not just saying they want to be doctors or nurses. They, they're talking about robotics, engineering, uh, hospital administration, uh, anything that has to do with getting people well. Uh, so it could be on the front lines for physicians and nurses, but it could be also be behind the lines, uh, such as hospital finance, uh, hospital administration. Uh, the majority of these students are advanced placement students, and most of them, when they graduate, they graduate high school with their associate degrees. Uh, and they have to work really hard throughout the year. So the they start in June working with public health me specifically, to uh, come up with projects that will increase uh, awareness of public health initiatives in the community, such as opioid abuse, uh, teen bullying, those kind of things. And for the entire school year, they have to work at different events, creating their portfolio. And they then advance to, they go to area, and the top three teams from area get to advance to state where they're competing against teams from uh, across the state of Texas, and then the top three teams from state advanced to nationals. And this group back here, come on up. No, they're, they're, they're really not shy, they're just pretending. Uh, they were determined to bring home nationals, and they went to Orlando, and they brought home that national award. This is the first time that that has been accomplished in DFW. Uh, area. Um, I wasn't able to be there with them. I was at another conference in Minneapolis, but trust me, they heard the scream from Minneapolis <laughs> to Orlando. The people in the restaurant thought I was nuts. Um, so uh, they've been with me all year. I would like to introduce them. Uh, Rita Himawan, Abdul, and I'm not going to pronounce it wrong, Abdamali, Abdahali, uh, Nimpaka, Nahimi Mampaka. Now, I have to tell y'all a story about this guy. And the first time I met him, and I sent an email out, you know, saying, okay, to the competition teams, and this is what we're going to be doing, so please respond to this email if you come to this training. And he responded and said, cool kid will be there. <laughs> and I'm like, who is cool kid? Is, you know, is that true? I mean, that's literally what he put on the registration form. So his certificate should actually say cool kid. Okay. That's what I call Very it. Good. And then the two shortest people, Fran Lopez uh, was the team captain, and Stephanie Perez. And I have to say one quick thing about Fran. Fran has been with me uh, for what, four years, three years? And when she came in, she was very quiet. Uh, she's no longer quiet. Uh, and a lot of people think, oh, it's nice that you're molding these kids. But let me tell you, I learn more from them than they do for me. And this year, when their advisor backed out, they were determined 
They were determined that they were going to go and win this national title, and they did. But I have to give kudos to one other person who helps me with my kiddos when I can't be there. Linda, where are you at? Stand up. Linda Redeemer, she's mom number two, because, you know, I call their parents and tell them, okay, they're going to make me choke them, you know, because, you know, I've asked them for this so many times. And the parents are like, do whatever you have to do. Uh, uh, but Glenda has helped me a lot, and I really couldn't do this without uh, my bosses, Sabrina Madari and Ann Sally Caldwell, and just uh, the wonderful people that I work with, but mostly without my students who are all uh, have at least a 3.5 GPA or higher. So. Yes, and I see I have a list here of where they're intending to go to school. So Fran, who's the team captain, uh, will attend UTA and major in biology. I did that too. Uh, Stephanie will attend UT Austin. Uh, Rita will attend UT Arlington and major in economics. Nahimi will attend TCU and major in computer science. And then Ahmad will attend UTA um, as a pre med biology major, or pre med major, rather. to uh, go ahead and ask that we record the certificates. Receive and file. Receive and file. We're going to do that. We're going to receive and file these certificates, and I'll come down and present them. I'll second that motion. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations to all of y'all for the hard work I know y'all put in to get to this point. So how long have you been working together as a team? Uh, just over a year. Just over a year? year? Brian has been the last three years, uh, but those two uh, got together. They were a year. Preston, who's also seen it in the audience, was part of the team last year, and they made it to the state last year, but they didn't get to national. So, now, so all of you are seniors, and you're all graduating, and so there'll be a new team up here next year that will have won. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Three flashes before you can leave. Get over and yeah, get in there. Oh, you're messing with his podium. <laughs> okay, He's all down in the one chair. Chair. future going out the doors right there. So, <laughs> thank y'all. Thank every one of you for all your hard work. We hear so much about what's wrong. It's so great to hear what's right. And uh, this is this is fantastic guys. So, Commissioner, thank you very much for Bringing those two. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I would like to announce next Tuesday will be um, no, not next Tuesday, it's this week. Uh, Friday. Friday. This Friday will be uh, Brown Baggett Day, and this is for the uh, Tarrant Area Food Bank. Um, and what they're asking is, is that you put an amount equal to what you would spend for lunch. Uh, in one of the brown bags, or and I'm going to go ahead. I'll, I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat lunch on well, we Friday. We don't have to get Wilder to put in for us. Huh? That's right. Well, where's Wilder? We don't buy lunch. Wilder does. Well, I'm going to put in. Lunch. Now I know I'm going to put twenty in there. I know you don't have anything less than a hundred in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so Y'all just put in there whatever in you your feel bag. Like. Well, no, we'll, we'll, I'm not. I got my own bag. Okay. We'll put it in your own bag. <laughs> I was just going to turn it in for United Way now. Yeah. yeah. We know how that United Way man is for. Put my name on it. Just a few facts to encourage y'all to, uh, to do this. This is 
something that we got from the uh, area food bank. In the United States, 40 million people, including 12 million children, don't always have enough food to eat. In North Texas, one of six people in North Texas struggles with hunger. One of four children comes from a family that lives with uncertainty about their next meal. Uh, when compared to other states, Texas has the second highest number of hungry children. Tarrant County is one of the top 10 counties in the United States with the highest number of hungry people overall. So uh, that's not one of the statistics about Tarrant County that I know we're, that we would be proud of. So if you have an opportunity, please, uh, please take an opportunity and give to the Tarrant Area Food Bank. Judge, there's one other thing you should maybe bring up, or I'll bring up. Down in the lobby on the first floor, oh, yeah. the Tarrant Food Bank is having a bake sale, and they got all kinds of great stuff down there. I bought a bunch of cookies, and I haven't eaten them, though. I'm saving them for Wilder. And uh, But they've got a lot of different things down there, so go well, down I there. Ate some stuff. I bought some stuff, and I've already you, eaten it, so Wilder's out of luck, huh? Wilder you didn't eat give it. any Wilder any more food. It's kind of like feeding the bears. You well, know? it's an old grumpy bear. Yeah. Um, so, again, if you can, please um, take an opportunity to either buy a little food down there and make a donation there, but also just, uh, if you can, uh, put what you'd eat for lunch. Put that amount in or whatever lunch you have on Friday. Just match that into the, into the food bank. Do you have something else you'd like to talk with us about? Yes. Go right ahead. So I want to be sure to um, announce the Hispanic Wellness Coalition, who's been hosting a wellness event for many years. They are hosting their North Texas Wellness Fair this coming Saturday, August 3rd, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the ESC Regional 11 office um, in White Settlement. And they will be providing a pretty comprehensive list of services, including free health screenings and checks for the entire family. And for the first time, the North Texas Wellness Fair will offer services to members of our community whose primary languages are Arabic and Vietnamese. Um, so if you would like more information about that, please contact our office. That's it. Okay, somebody come up here and get these sacks before we set them here and leave them here and they get thrown away. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Board members, you have before you our consent agenda. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Manius. <laughs> members of the court, we have three additional items for the court's consideration this morning. The first one, we're requesting that the court approve the First Amendment to a commercial lease agreement between JPS and McDonald's. Move approval. Second. second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. I'm going to ask Ms. Willis to come up and make the presentation on item two. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. The Resource Connection Advisory Board and I would like to respectfully request your approval of the rules for visitors to the natural area of the Resource Connection. The natural area is approximately 125 acres of remnant prairie on the north side of campus, and it is often commonly called Stella Rowan Prairie. The, um, we worked with a member of the Native Prairie Association of Texas, as well as the district attorney's office to draft these rules for your consideration and approval. The rules will help us protect and preserve the prairie for many years to come and for people to enjoy for many years to come. Move, Move approval. approval. Second. second. We have motion and seconds. Motions and seconds. Please vote. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, members of the court, on item number three, we're requesting that the commissioner's court approve interim funding for the um, district attorney's protective order unit for a period not to exceed 60 days. This is just to upfront some money for a state grant that we're probably going to get once that grant uh, is received will be reimbursed for this. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Mr. Maxwell. Good 
Good morning, Judge. Commissioners, Good morning. I appreciate you uh, recognizing my group down there on the first floor of uh, their bake sale. We do know how to throw a party and we do know how to cook food. So I know, I, I, know smell, it. I smell it just about mo at least once a week, most weeks. <laughs> Commissioner Johnson did uh, participate this morning and uh, he said it was very good too. So you better well, hurry up. It'll be, it won't be long for it to be gone. I think you heard at least three of us participate. I, know. Yes, I don't know I, about the fourth of the I, group. But, uh, uh, Vonna took care of it for our office. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hurry up. We are requesting the court uh, receive and file the Tarrant County financial statements for June 2019. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you all for everything you do. Ms. Worthy. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to first request that you receive and file the personnel agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Receive and file the personnel agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Our second item is to request that the Commissioner's Court approve the Tarrant County's annually determined contribution rate for the Tarrant County and District Retirement System, which will go into effect on January 1st, 2020. Each year we bring this to you for your consideration. Um, the retirement system does provide us with a required rate, and this year our required rate is 14.11%. That's considered our basic rate, and that will um, allow TCRS to invest on our behalf and for us to pay down our unfunded liabilities on a 20-year plan. Okay. So each year during this process and this discussion, you all make a decision of whether uh, what your funding rate is and whether we want to uh, provide a COLA to our retirees. There are two methods to provide this COLA. One would be a flat rate COLA, and the other is based on the consumer price index. If a COLA is funded, it is funded over a, it is, uh, the contribution rate is funded over a 15-year period, and um, of course, if we pay it uh, um, with the funded rate, it still might uh, cause our rates to creep up. So the flat rate is based on the retiree's current benefit amount, and it benefits all retirees. The CPA, CPI uh, COLA would take into consideration inflation, and it will be based on how the inflation has impacted impacted retirees, so not all retirees would receive that COLA, okay? In recent years, the county has authorized higher rates in order to pay down our unfunded liabilities and to uh, uh, give COLAs to our retirees. As of December 31st, 2018, our funding ratio is at 87.8%, and our goal has been to get to 90%. Over the f last few years, we have been making improvements on our funding ratios. So at this time, uh, I want you to consider four options that we've provided to you. So our option one is what our current plan is, which is a funding rate of 19.5% with no COLA. That would result in a little over $16 million being contributed to our unfunded liability. Our second option would be provide a 50% CPI COLA with the same election rate of 19.5%. That would result in unfunded liability contributions of 7.7 .7 million, with the cost of the COLA being 8 point, almost 3 million. So option three would be a 1% flat rate, which is what we chose for 2019. And again, the 19.5% um, contribution rate which would result in 7.9% going to um, unfunded liability and 8.1% to the COLA. Option uh, four would be a 40% CPI, and you'll notice 10% increments in the CPI, so we can choose any CPI in increments of 10. We've provided these to, to you for your consideration. Again, the funding rate would be 19.5%. The resulting unfunded liability contri contribution would be at about 14 million and the cost of the COLA would be approximately 2 million. So these cost of COLAs are um, based on actuar 
actuarial, I can never say that word, <laughs> assumptions and include mortality rates and TCDRS investment returns. And of course, they're based on long-term experience. So I'm happy to answer questions or have any kind of discussion you'd like to have at this time. So basically, the, um, the flat rate means that everybody gets a 1% increase in there, whatever their uh, benefit is, mm -hmm. and that's approximately $7.9 million. Yes, sir. And then about 8 would still go toward our unfunded liability. Uh, we had, TCDRS had a conference last week, and I, will, uh, I attended as did uh, Commissioner Allen, and they're doing very well. Uh, we should be very thankful that we are in TCDRS. I think they do a super job. Um, Mary Louise is on that board and uh, represents us well. Um, one of the things that I did that I, I really had not caught on to before was they also have a group life insurance program um, that basically for uh, a little for about a hundred thousand dollars more than what we're paying for our group benefit right now gives everybody one times their salary right now our group insurance is one time salary up to a maximum of fifty thousand that's because of some IRS things I don't want to get into we're in the process of researching whether or not we might consider that but I don't think that's a decision that we need to even get into discussing today. What we're primarily looking for today here is what do we want to do with the retirees? Um, the 40%, the reason that the 40% of CPI is so much different than the 50% is again based upon the fact that as you look at the calculation um, and you go backwards, it takes into account whether or not previous amounts that we have given exceed either the 40% COLA or a 50% COLA. And there's about a $5 million difference there. Um, and it's, it's just because we have given the flat. The last couple of years, uh, I think we've chosen, go ahead. We did, the first year we did a flat rate was last year. Uh, prior to that, um, we had been doing the 50% of CPI. There was a couple of years where the court decided not to do a COLA. Basically, that was tied into years when uh, Medicare did not, and Social Security did not do a, an increase. Uh, historically, prior to 2011, uh, we were doing the 80% of CPI. So that's still in the pipeline. And so until we see all of that fall out, we're still going to see that um, amount included in the unfunded liability amount. But last year was the first year of the flat rate, which gave everybody a rate increase. If we do, if we drop back to the 40%, it's just going to give those retirements 2012 and forward a raise. So what are your, do you have questions or do you have I think what we did last year probably is fine. That would be option three. Would be, the be one option three. three, and it would be this. It's how much again goes toward the the unfunded liability would get seven point nine and about eight point one for cola. Okay. And and do remember, as long as we continue to give colas, we're designated as a employer that gives colas, which does Im impact uh, financial reporting. And we are currently designated as a repeating cola. And that, that pertains to <laughs> the GASB that, that we put on there. And what they do is they assume that unless we don't do it for two years, they assume that we're going to do it forever. And that adds and increases our unfunded liability for not for the pension plan, but for our other post retirement, post post employment benefits. Um, so if we do this, what will our uh, unfunded liability 
the the estimate is that it will be at eight seven point four. And it's what now? It's eight seven point eight. Now those are based on they we the only the most current information they have is twelve thirty one eighteen. So those are based on projections, and it, it but that is their estimate. The eight seven point. Eighty-seven point four. And I might contend that I, that I, I think it might be a little bit higher than that because again, we're. It all depends. Last year we were doing great this time because the market was up, and then the market went the tank in December, mm -hmm. and that's when it and its value as of December thirty-first. Uh, so as a result of that, we didn't, you know, the eighty-seven point eight. Uh, was based upon a, a, a much lower market. Now, there's nothing to say that it's not going to go down again this December. But as of now, it's you know it, it's up above where it was last year plus a good a good term. So we don't we don't really and can't really forecast where we're going to end up on the unfunded liability. But I think we've continued to make progress. Um, in, in 2018, it was listed as 86.3, 2017, 81.2, and so we've been m making fairly steady progress progressions. Uh, remind me, have we set our retiree premiums? No, sir. We no, have sir. not set those no, yet. Sir. One of the things that at least I have thought about in the past is that, you know, if our insurance <coughs> premiums are going up, for everybody that's on our insurance program as a retiree, as a Medicare eligible retiree, then uh, us increasing that premium a little bit or increasing the, re the revenue that they're getting may offset what our increase in um, premiums are. And I said for Medicare only, it's not Medicare only, it would be all of our retirees from that standpoint. Can we go back to 2016, why we didn't do a COLA? I'm sorry? Why we did not do a COLA in 2016. Um, if I'm guessing, it, what I'm going to tell you is, is that that was a year when Social Security and that did not give any sort of an increase that, and that correct. they felt like that the inflation was little, if any. And so we did not choose at that point in time to, to give any increase in uh, – our retirement at that point. Okay, time. and you'd share that. I'm just trying to make sure I heard that right. Okay. Okay. And then what about in 2012? Why we did it? I think 2012, and Joyce can stop me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Is that was when we we began to be identified as a repeat cola provider, and mm -hmm. we kind of took a step back, and we're trying to make a decision about that. That's correct. Correct. The uh, rate had creeped up so significantly year after year mm -hmm. because of us doing 80% of CPI, and so that was a year where we just said, hold off, you know, let's, let's stop this rate creep, and so that was the year, 2012, there was no COLA because of changing to a different approach, and so then the following year, we did the 50%. In addition to that, that's when we started hearing about the uh, gas fee. Yeah, well, and I think the other thing that we were looking at is at that point in time, we had previously made, we had previously, as GK had helped me here, I think that was at a point in time where we were not making lump sum payments. Right, that's correct. That's correct. In the deal. And it, so it was adding significantly to our accrual rate. And we began, we really realized that, so we stopped a year. And then subsequent to that, we began it again. But we said when we began it that we were going to pay it all as a lump sum so that it didn't affect our future percentages. Yeah. We did that for a couple of years. Yeah, we did it for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden it dawned on us that when we did that, we were paying the state's share for CSCD. Okay. And we decided from that point forward that we were going to do it as a percentage throughout the year so that CSCD would pay their percentage, and therefore the state would pay their percentage in Tarrant County wouldn't be paying it. Now, to, in fairness to CSCD, they paid us, they reimbursed us on those lump sum payments 
for the share of those lump sum payments that belong to our probation. Mm -hmm. and, Again, and, uh, ref refresher, CSCD employees are actually state employees. They get right. state benefits, but we take care of paying them through Tarrant County. <coughs> and up until probably 10 years ago, they were actually county employees. And even though we do the W-2s for them, they're actually state employees <coughs> from that standpoint. And so that, that number has been like around 700,000 or something like that, right? Sounds about right. Okay. And back at that time, our, our uh, funding ratio was down around 80%. So you can see that that's part of the reason we took the step yeah. back to do it as a funding uh, amount rather than in the lump sums because it was building on our In order funding. to maintain our AAA rating with the rating agencies, a healthy uh, financial statement should be somewhere at, at a minimum of about 80% funded on something like this. And our goal now has been stepped up and, and with the lump sums. And we're, you know, I would love to get to 90 or above. And we're, we're getting closer, but we've still got a, you know, we still got a way to go. I don't have any more questions. Did someone make a motion? No, we don't have a, we don't have a decision at this point. So the motion was for option three. The motion, or the commissioner fixed <laughs> moved option three. The one percent flat. One percent flat. Uh, for number one. Option three. I second that. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other questions or discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Good morning. Good morning. We have three items for your consideration this morning. Our first item is a boot order recommendation for B uh, RFP 2019-089. It's an RFP for library automation software for the medical examiner's office. Recommendation be toward the GXP partners in the amount of $31,200. If this item is approved, we're also seeking contract approval from the court. Move approval. Second. Got a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two, also a bid award recommendation for bid 2019-194. This is a new contract for janitorial supplies. Uh, recommendation be toward the primary, secondary, and alternate vendors on a per enterprise basis is shown your court communique. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Last item item in regards to RFP 2019 179. This is an annual contract for forensic accident reconstruction, consultation, expert witnesses, and support services for the CDA's office. Uh, we did receive two proposals. Uh, we are recommending reduction of both of those and asking that we be allowed to rebid with revised specifications. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Josh. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, has this interlocal been approved by the DA's office? It has Thank you. Move approval of item 8B. One, A and B. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Are there any appointments today? Any none. And we have before you the claims, including the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. A motion to second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Briefing items, Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Member of the Court, we have three items. The first one, item A, is a, a briefing by the um, District Attorney's Office as it relates to SB 1640. Mr. Taylor is here to address the Court at this time. Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Good morning. Our office wanted to brief this Court about the changes 
in the Texas Open Meetings Act that came from this past legislative session, specifically about the changes to the walking quorum situation. Now, before I begin, I want to convey to this court that I'm going to present the, the law to you, SB 1640, and I'm more than happy to answer any general questions out here about the law, about anything specifically about why the law changed, but I think any specific questions to as it, as it pertains to advice of counsel should be addressed in a closed session environment. It's agendized for closed session today, and I can answer those specific questions at that time. But if you have any other questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask now, and I'll try my best to answer them unless it's getting towards advice of counsel. Now, I wanted to begin by first giving you a definition of what exactly we're talking about when dealing with walking quorums. Now, the definition of a walking quorum is a series of gatherings or communications among separate groups of members of a governmental body that are each less than a quorum of the members. So for instance, if this, this body was meeting with Commissioner Brooks and Commissioner Allen, and then there was a separate action or separate discussion or gathering with Commissioner Fickus and Commissioner Johnson, each of those meetings are less than a quorum. However, together, if, they, if you guys were talking about policy situations or policy decisions, policy decisions, or if there was some sort of weighing of options between the two individual uh, gatherings that are less than a quorum, that would be considered a walking quorum in violation of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Now, the policy concern is that members of a governmental body will attempt to skirt or circumvent the law by coming to a collective decision through a series of informal discussions outside of an open meetings, outside of an open meeting. And that's exactly what the legislature is attempting to thwart with our open meetings law. Now before the legislature passed Senate Bill 1640, the old 551.143 of the government code specifically stated that a member or group of members of a governmental body violates the Texas Open Meetings Act if it conspires to circumvent the law by meeting in less than a quorum for the purpose of secret deliberations. Now the problem with that law is in Montgomery County, the county judge was, was brought up for a violation of that particular statute. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals in State versus Doyle said that the law was unconstitutionally vague, that you could not tell exactly what the issue was from, from the wording of that particular law. So the legislature's response in this past legisl legislative session was to pass Senate Bill 1640 and to change the, change the wording of the law in order to provide members of a governmental entity with guidance on what is and is not allowed. And with your permission, I have a copy of the law I would like to hand to you guys so as we go through it, you can kind of take a look as well. Does this law pertain to the state legislature and Senate as well? It does. I do. Sorry. <laughs> now, 1640. Let me ask the question in regards to that. Yes, sir. So, in the Senate, before a bill can even be brought up, it has to have two thirds, and there's usually a card handed in by the author of the bill to the lieutenant governor that says, I've got my two thirds go forth and call up the bill and suspend the rules. So is that a walking violation of yep. the quorum rule? And I'm sorry, you're saying, you're asking if... In the in the state senate right now, mm -hmm. the, it's, you're right, it's now 60%, 60%, that in order for an author to have their bill brought up, they give, they basically tell the lieutenant governor that they have gotten 60% permission to bring up a bill. So isn't that ba basically going to constitute a uh, act that would be in violation of this law? No, and the reason why is, first of all, there's specific rules governing that particular item, which is exempted from this rule, but also, once we go, as we go through 
this particular statute, you see that, and I, it's a very wordy bill. And so I kind of broke it down to, in, even the handwritten portions you have, I numbered them to, so you can see six separate distinctions that must occur for there to be a violation of this, of this particular act. And the first of which, Judge, is that you must engage in at least one communication among a series that occur outside of a meeting. That's number one. And it, all of this is done knowingly. You have to knowingly engage in that communication. Number two is that it must concern an issue within your jurisdiction. So basically, it must concern an issue in which you have the authority over, and of course, dealing with the commissioner's court, since you are uh, given authority to govern over everything within that particular, uh, within, within a particular county, at that point, it would be almost anything dealing with the county government. Number three, there must be less than a quorum during the individual communications. So right now we have you engaging in at least one communication amongst a series. It must concern an issue within your jurisdiction, and the uh, individual discussions must be with less than a quorum during those individual communications. Number four, there must be a series of communications that constitute a quorum. So this means if you have two separate groups or two separate gatherings in which both of those groups are less than a quorum, those series of communications must involve a quorum of that governmental body. The next, you have to know it involved or would involve a quorum. So if you have an individual, a member of a, of a governmental body that is engaging in communications that are less than a quorum, that particular member has to know that either that it has already involved a quorum or there's going to be a series in which there will be a quorum of that governmental body. And finally, it must constitute a deliberation. Deliberation is simply defined as a verbal or written exchange with a quorum present about something within the court's jurisdiction. So you have to have all of these elements, so to speak, in order to be a foul of 551.143 of the government code, the walking quorum situation. So, Judge, in that, in that circumstance, it wouldn't be a violation of, if looking at each element, it wouldn't be a violation of that specific statute. Now, moreover, uh, I believe that looking at, I went back and looked at all of the particular debate over 551.143, and I do believe there will be a change in the way government enti governmental entities govern themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and within that debate, there was nothing discussed about uh, to what extent that would be. So governmental entities are kind of left up to themselves right now as far as guidance. And I think I'll, provide, I'll be able to provide further assistance of that in, in a closed session environment. Are there any further questions about the generalities of the law? Yes, sir. Let me ask. So, okay, let's just use real people. It's always and dangerous. This gentleman here on my left, he and I go to lunch. And during that lunch, we talk about a lot of things, but one of them might be the budget, Tarrant County budget. Commissioner Allen, Judge Whitley go to lunch. They talk about a lot of things, and they may talk about the budget, because that's what we're working on, and, you know, whatever. Have we violated a law at that point? Or do one of us, Commissioner Johnson and I, need to talk to one of them, and that's what triggers the violation? And Commissioner Fick, is this, this, that's a specific question since we're getting with specific individuals that I would probably prefer to answer in a closed session environment. I think that's a very good question. I think I should address it at that point under advice of counsel. Since uh, since it is properly agendized for today, if 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 you don't do not mind, if I, I table that. I guess. Yes. Okay. So, what was added to the bill was or written exchange. Generally speaking, do you have anything to add on that in terms of written communication? There is there was a debate in the previous bill of whether written communications would or would not constitute a violation of that particular act. I believe that particular portion as far as deliberations, 
um, was just a clarification to make sure it did in fact include written discussion. Uh, during the debate on the Senate floor, there was a discussion of how the old bill, you had this kind of circular situation in which the, the term meeting meant a deliberation and a deliberation meant that you're having a meeting. So there was, there was this circular definition, the situation in which no one really knew what those meant. And so I think that the legislature wanted to kind of clarify that, make sure the written part was in there, and uh, to kind of leave the meeting, meeting definition somewhat similar to what it was. But any other general questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Members Court, a week ago to item B. This is the compensation system survey update. Ms. Glenn. Good morning. Good morning. So we're back again. Uh, this is the annual compensation update. Uh, Mr. Paul Glogowski uh, is here this morning. Uh, so he'll be providing the overview this is a briefing item, so we're not asking or expecting any court action today. Uh, and just as a follow-up note, uh, we do have our meeting with the law enforcement group uh, has been scheduled. In the event that anybody was wondering, that will be on August the 7th at 1130 a.m. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner, uh, Judge and Commissioners. and. I've been here so many times, I feel like I should give to the brown bag effort. I'm going to put it there. Let me just hold that for you. To keep it over there, from away from <laughs> over there. He's not going to be able to so. talk <laughs> Put that in the envelope with Wilders. <laughs> I was trying to put it in a bag, but it, the bag's headed out pretty quickly. Thank you so much. We have uh, been together many years doing this basic presentation, so I think uh, history has said. Um, to keep it as brief as possible, but certainly answer any questions that you may have as we go through the deck. And, I, and JD normally makes that same comment. <laughs> uh, so I would f forward, uh, because this deck was put in, page numbers might be a little off from what I have in front of me, but I would go to a, a page that's marked seven, I guess. I can see it from here, that's a good sign. That over the years, uh, uh, the court has generally adopted a philosophy of where they would like to target employee pay for the county. Well, and, ideal, it's page four. So don't oh, let wow. Him, don't let him. Okay. I'll, mind, I'll try to do the math from that page four. Uh, anyway, uh, so the, the target or the philosophy is said basically in a compensation terminology, we'd like to target our pay at the 25th percentile of the market. For most employees, not all, the market is made up of public and private sector employers. The biggest exception would be the law enforcement group. So this kind of, at a very, very high level, mushes all the different employee subgroups that we have that we look at individually, exempt, non-exempt, craft, law enforcement, IT, exempt and non-exempt management. It takes all that information and kind of tries to give you a big picture uh, of where, where in fact are you paying your people relative uh, in aggregate relative to the target of the 25th percentile. And uh, it's a graph that you can hard, it's hard to read the different lines because they're so close to each other. So I would say as the outside person making a, an opinion on this particular chart is if the goal is to pay people near the 25th percentile, uh, you, you're almost exactly doing that. But maybe, you know, with some slight statistical difference, but I think it's fair to say the management of the program by the court and the HR department uh, is keeping you on track of what you've stated at one point in time that you'd like to do. That's just a high level chart. This chart we've had in the presentation for numerous years. This then gives you, this is kind of peel the onion or unpeel the onion. We're looking at each separate group. Uh, the group listed on the left hand column, exempt, management, non exempt. Kind of at a high level, what kind of market are we looking at? Is it national, local? Is it public sector, private sector? Uh, for law enforcement, it's city and counties. Uh, governments in the local area. It, it gives a little bit of text around um, where that group resides in aggregate for the group itself relative to the either the market 50th percentile or market 25th percentile. Uh, we've underlined some words in there, uh, usually that has something to do with where are you 
where's that particular group relative to the 25th percentile? Uh, and then I have some commentary, so you don't necessarily have to read everything. But I'll just take group by group quickly and do a, how did that group look last year? How did that group look this year? And did they kind of gain ground or lose ground to the market? And any gain or loss is very minute and almost, almost statistically irrelevant. But for example, the exempt population relative to last year, they're down about 1.4% from this same picture last year on a year over year basis. So they've lost a little ground. That's happened a couple of years in a row already. The management group lost a little ground. They lost about 2.8%, but relative to the 25th percentile, they're still well above, 6% plus above the 25th percentile. So maybe they're trending back to the 25th. You could maybe say it that way. The non-exempt lost about 1.5%. Uh, they're still, they're just now just a little bit below market, less than 2%. The IT exempt, it's kind of been flat year over year. Uh, almost doesn't make sense that that group would stick out as flat. The IT non-exempt lost a little bit of ground, about 2%. The craft gained ground, oh, I'm sorry, the IT non-exempt gained ground, about 2% plus. The craft gained ground, about 3%. The law enforcement lost a little bit of ground. And all in all, you're generally, again, aggregately keeping pace with what your overall philosophy is. Our recommendations, <coughs> based on our analysis, try to tweak those different groups in terms of their structure moves or their structure increases or not to better get back in line with the market if they're just narrowly off. Can you repeat um, the gains for non-exempt and for craft? I'm sorry, the gain for non-exempt on a year-over-year -year basis, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, IT non-exempt was 2.4%. And for craft, it was 2.9%. Okay. What about for non-exempt? Non-exempt was a down about 1.5% year okay. over year. Great. Thank you. There are a lot of dynamics that go into that, if you think about that. Uh, certainly, what did the market do is, is one of them, and it is a big one. But what's happened to your payroll uh, year over year? And as people move into different grades or get hired from the outside, um, that dynamic of where your actual pay can be, have an influence on losing ground potentially, not just what the market did. So for example, if, if um, high level, if Tina were to retire at a, a particular wage she was making at the time, and because I know some of the people behind me were just doing this illustratively, and Robin was promoted into that job, there's a pretty good chance that Tina may have been paid more than Robin would be paid as Robin came into the job. So now it says for that grade, you've lost some salary, just statistically. So those kinds of things, if you just multiply by all the changes going on in an organization of this size, can have an impact on it. You know, we gained or lost ground statistically. Sure. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I think you gave that same okay. example when we met. Okay, so okay, good. thank you. Uh, just some reminders of the size of some of these groups. So when, when, uh, when we're looking at statistics and trying to aggregate information, when you have small groups like the management group and small groups like the IT non-exempt group, you know, small fluctuations in those groups could even have a more dramatic effect of year over year. And I think you kind of can see that sometimes in the results. The next slide would just be very high level. Uh, and I know that uh, Ange, I believe, is going to come up after me and present some costing estimates uh, based on her calculations of our recommendations. So we're going to, like we almost all we do, we're going to say for each one of those groups, exempt, non-exempt, IT, so forth, we're going to make a recommendation on how that structure or those structures should change. Generally, we've recommended those be increased uh, when we do that, when we make that recommendation. And then we look at each grade level within each group, and we might modify a high grade in one group moving X percent, a lower grade moving X minus percent or X plus percent. But we're doing all those to better align your structure with the 25th percentile. We're going to show you what those recommendations are in the next slide. So think about structure changes as what we are trying to do to attract, when we need to attract people to the county. So it's an, it's, what should our ranges be to be competitive when we make an offer to somebody at sometimes max and higher rate 
We have to stay competitive to bring people in. So that's the attract part of the equation. So we're going to make structure change recommendations. The next bullet is the budget, and that has to do with retaining people once you get them. It's what should we pay them to stay competitive. So we're recommending about a 3.0% PFP budget again this year. It's fluctuated just slightly what our recommendations have been over the past maybe 10 years or so, mostly to do with the market's been doing the same thing. They got kind of lockstep in a low inflation year of what do we think we should get for it for an increase. And, uh, and not giving more than CPI certainly has not been looked upon as something the market's wanted to do. We're going to go through the next several pages. This is just an illustration. Uh, and we have, we have every group on the following pages. But this is an illustration of when we look at the market relative to the exempt group, we're saying the top of the structure for the exempt group is a slightly more it is slightly less it positioned to the 25th percentile than the bottom end of the structure. So the bottom grade values, mid, minimum midpoint, maximum are closer to P25 than the top. So we're saying kind of a staggered approach on how the structure should be increased. All in effect to try to align with the, what the market's telling us in the exempt group. So we make a recommendation for exempt, non-exempt, I mean a management about 2.5%. They're pretty well positioned already non-exempt, uh, similar to what the exempt structure looked like, a little bit higher structure increase at the top, a little bit lower increase at the bottom. Uh, IT uh, exempt, uh, kind of a combination of a lot of same, but a few different increases. IT on exempt, 2% across the board. Law enforcement across the board, 3%. Craft across the board, about 2%. So at a very high level, I mean, that's what we're recommending. I know, I know Ange has the cost. The information in the back set of slides is kind of a visual of all that information. Uh, so I'm just going to just go to one of those as an example. Uh, that would be slide 11. Uh, so this then just says, here's what the exempt population looks like, uh, standalone. There's some data at the bottom that gives you some kind of tabular information. How far are you plus or minus a given market point? Uh, we're using that kind of information to help us uh, predict what the what the range structure should be. And notice uh, for your policy, you're pretty close to the the red line at the bottom, and you're a little far away from the red line when you get all the way to the top. Just a visual, and you have every, you have one of those for each of the policy groups. That's generally the presentation level I've made over the past several years. I, of course, more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, when we met a few weeks ago, you would, um, I'd ask for a <coughs> list of all of the participants that were unionized. Do you have that list today? We do not have okay. that. I'm so sorry. I will get that. Okay. And that was... I believe the question was the unionized law enforcement group. For the, I guess the 17 participants that are used for the okay. analysis. Okay, that's right. I, I need to get that for you. I apologize. Okay. Thanks. The structure adjust. I mean, as we kind of go forward, given the events of the legislature and the 3.5% cap, basically what we have, what the adjustment to the structure allows especially within the law enforcement area. We have increased the steps by the structure adjustment so an individual who is not maxed out will get not only the structure adjustment but also the step increase for a combined increase in salary. Correct. Um, with the 3.5% cap, like for example, you're recommending here a 3% increase in structure, structure. So that means each one of the steps would be increased by 3%. Correct. And then in addition, an officer who is not maxed out would move to the next step, which incorporates in probably, what, a 3, 3.5%? Three 3-ish, three three yeah. 3-ish. So that would be a total of 6%. Correct. Which on a go-forward basis may push us either over the 3.5% that the um, 
state has said we would we have to go to a vote of the of the mm -hmm. citizens from that standpoint. And that's going to make that very because what 70 80 percent of our budget is salaries, salaries and benefits. Yeah. So that's something that we need to think about in this particular budget, but we know that it will, this upcoming budget, but we know that it will definitely impact us next year when we're under the, um, under the caps. Yeah, and, you know, think about, you know, when this data was collected, because we did start this process in an effort to get in front of you as early as possible for your decision making. So we polled, you know, all those cities and counties before the bill was clearly passed or even anybody really knew much about what direction it was going. So in next year's, if we're fortunate enough to do it, next year's, you should start seeing any other potential reactions from your peers on what they're doing. But so it, in a certain sense, uh, it's not reflected in the data yet. But I, definitely I would agree, uh, Judge, that put in a position where kind of our income stream, if you will, is going to be capped and our expenses are being pushed to go quicker than the cap. Yeah. yeah. My wife and I have that discussion every day. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, what can you afford to pay? So that's the other part. And Ange, I think, has um, some detail on the cost. What it cost us. Yes, yes, sir. And I'm certainly staying around if there's any other questions. Thank you. Good morning. So you have a one sheet attachment with the presentation that shows the numbers that budget pulled together. I didn't pull these together. So you have the total expense for all structure, step, and merit that's currently proposed. All of that together is in the ballpark of $12.18 million. Once we meet with the law enforcement folks next week, we should be able to come back with a full set of recommendations for you for all merit, structure, step, Etc. Any questions about the budget? So, does the 12.1 million include uh, the three percent uh, recommendation by Paul for law enforcement? Yes. So that's that's inside that. Okay. I'm to find that. So, not related to the attachment, but um, mm -hmm. for the the graph. That we that's up on the screen right now, where it has the TC policy line and the TC actual line. What are the um, factors that go into what policy is versus what it, the actual is? The TC policy is the midpoint of the range, so it's the average of the min and the max of each rain, okay. range. The TC actual is what the average pay for those uh, position, well, for those job points are along the bottom. So okay. it's actual pay versus the policy, which is the midpoint. Okay. I'm probably going to ask you that ten times. That's is okay. The, <laughs> is the policy, is that also set at the P25, or does that have anything to do with the P25? The goal is to get the policy towards P25. So when it drops below at the upper end there, that's when you see our structures okay. start moving a little bit more. So what we're saying on that chart right there is that our policy – is the mid is the average between min, uh, minimum and is it minimum or higher end? Minimum. So it's the average between minimum and maximum. Mm -hmm. The actual is what we're actually paying, which takes into account folks who've been here for a longer period of time and would have higher compensation just because of that seniority. It goes back to the Tina example you gave. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual red line that says P25 is what by your survey, the P25 line would be. And so when we're below that, that means we're paying below P25, and your structure recommendations would be to try to get us closer to the P25. That's correct. There are some instances where we're above it, but not many. That's why you, that's why you saw, if you go back on to one of the slides on exempt, I think that structure adjustment was 6%. Mm -hmm. And that's trying to bring that green line up closer, closer to, the to the red, rim, to the lower rim. That's correct. And, and I mean, this is a little bit more than what we normally see in a given year, I believe. 
And that's <clears throat> what, to some extent, I mean, right now, Helen and I know we're not there yet. We st you still got a, a week, which means 24 hours times seven, which is about what you're going to be working this next week. Actually, two um, days. Two days. Well, I guess that's right. Um, <coughs> kind of what are you see? what's your draft, what you think we're going to be at? What's percentages? I mean, are we... An increase from uh -huh. last, I mean, an increase from last year? Yeah. Uh, roughly five to six percent. Five to six percent. And last year we ended at around four percent? Correct. That's increasing rec reserves as recommended. Um, it's also a large reclass uh, group that's not historically been there. New positions, yes, 154 new position requests. Not and how many we've recommended, but there was 154 new position requests. And that is compared to the previous year of? Approximately 60 requested. And y'all ended up, we ended up granting, you recommended originally. We recommended 27 and the end was 33. Okay. And you're in... I know we're not there yet, and you can be influenced, but um, I don't think so. <laughs> well, there may be four or five people who might influence you. Yes, that's correct. Um, you're currently recommending how many? 42. Out of 150? Four. 154. 154. So that's about a third. A little less than a third. A little less than a third. Twenty-nine percent. Okay. When do we see that list of what you're recommending? Do you have time to talk today? Pardon me. Do you have time to talk today? Uh, I want a list. You don't need to talk today. Okay. Just show me. <laughs> okay. So you can get the list. You can pass the list out to everybody <coughs> today. Yeah. In that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. <laughs> so we just make, need to make sure it's accurate. Yeah. Well, it's always accurate up until the time that we tell you. Y'all are having a nice conversation, but what's the? I mean, you can pass to that out today, and if we, I mean, she may make. That's why I said we're still a week away, but that's okay. Or we're actually six days away. What we normally do is is give the court a budget letter. And uh, remember the budget letter that should come out. Yeah, that comes out on Friday, and no, I think it, com it comes out on a Thursday. And that's what our goal is. Again, and we'll talk about that. And and while the budget letter will have some backup material, but you know, and I would encourage you to, um, if, if you all would like to see that list, then then the budget director can make that available to you. Obviously, that's what I asked for. And I might also maybe request that we see capital requests and the, our capital recommendations because those are the two big areas right. that, and, and you know, I guess <coughs> at the same time, let me ask this question because that may be in part why <coughs> there's a reluctance to do that. Have you notified the departments? No. Okay. Then I, I, I think what I would suggest is is I, I still don't have a problem. I mean, I think you ought to give send it to us because you got it. You got a pretty good idea. Send it to us. Let us look at it. But at the same time, spit it out there and let the uh, let the department heads know what we're recommending because that's just going to open the the floodgates to people who are not getting what they want to come to us. And and I think what we're going to have to understand, and, and that's in part why I ask some of these questions, is that we're already at a six to seven percent increase in our budget. Last year we gave people more staff as they came and asked for us, and we went from about a third recommended by the budget to over fifty percent. 
this year, if we do the same, uh, we're going to add a whole lot more to our salaries. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to do it. We're, we're going to consider it just like we always consider it. But it's um, this will give us a little bit more time. And with 154 requests and you're only recommending 42, Two. Uh, we're allowed to hear a lot more gnashing of teeth. So, um, of course, uh, the difference between 70 and 154 is a pretty big difference, too. Other questions are at this point in time, so. And law enforcement's going to meet when? Next Wednesday. The 7th. So you're going to meet after the budget has begun. And remember, as each of you know, next week is the beginning of the budget process for, for the court. We need to, we will initially set our budget the uh, second week of September. Yeah, September somewhere around the probably the 10th. We're meeting uh, next Wednesday at 1130, which is the only time that GK can make. His schedule is pretty tight. <laughs> so it's, this is on his schedule. I appreciate that, Commissioner. I really do. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to run away now. <laughs> Maybe you'll be more flexible next <laughs> time. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, members of the court, we can now go to item C. And um, this is a briefing on a historic site tax exemption at 714 Main Street. Ms. McMillan. Good morning, Judge Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. As Mr. Mania says, this is a briefing on a request for historic site tax exemption. Um, it has been quite a while since we have considered a historic site exemption, and for that reason, I included the historic site tax exemption policy in your packets as a refresher. Um, we actually um, initiated this policy in 1994. And it was at that time to encourage um, apartments and affordable rental properties in downtown, the use of historic structures and turning old office buildings into apartments. And the first one we did that with was the electric building. And we followed, um, we did that also for the TMP terminal building. Those were um, also in the terminal turned into loft apartments. Um, and then also uh, we um, uh, modify the policy because we saw the need also to take the historic, some of the historic buildings and use them for the need of additional hotel space to support the convention business down in downtown. And um, we amended the policy so that it provided for permanent and temporary multifamily and um, housing. And we used it for the Blackstone Hotel when that was renovated to the Courtyard Marriott. So that's kind of where the background is. And, I, and our policy is said to encourage the rehabilitation and restoration of certain historic properties used for multifamily residential facilities, again, to save multifamily permanent and temporary housing. So that's kind of where we're at on the historic exemption. Now, one of the things, it's kind of structured, our policy is structured similar to a tax abatement. We set it for a maximum of 10 years and um, we have certain information they provide. But the difference is that it is reviewed by the Historical Commission um, to look at the historic nature of the renovations, to make recommendations to the Commissioner's Court on the granting of this exemption. So as we move forward with the process, we now um, have had a request for the 714 Main um, building. Um, this building, you may recall, is, um, was also known as the Transport Life Building. Historically, it was the Farmers and Mechanic Building. Um, it was built in 1921, and this 24-story building was Fort Worth's tallest building until 1957. The building was actually added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2012 following ex extensive um, facade renovation by the previous owner, um, and it was most recently housed as offices for XTO Energy. Now, the proposed redevelopment will convert the building into a Kempton Hotel with approximately 200 
26 guest rooms and approximately 1,500 square feet of banquet, meeting, and restaurant and bar facilities. The total design and renovation costs for this project are estimated at over $36.5 million, with an additional $10 million in new furniture, fixture, and equipment to be added to the site. Upon completion of the project, it's also expected to provide a minimum of 30 full-time equivalent jobs with an annual payroll of over $4.5 million. The Tarrant County Historical Commission did review and consult with the developer on the renovation of the project and has recommended that the Commissioner's Court grant a historic site tax exemption as the application suggests. Um, as the developer will come up later and talk a little bit more about it, but there is, um, because the exterior has already been um, extensively renovated, most of the renovation is to the interior of the building only. The City of Fort Worth has previously granted historic site exemption for this property and has also entered into a 10-year <coughs> economic development program agreement to provide a rebate of up to 58% of the city's hotel occupancy tax that is generated by the hotel up to a maximum of $6 million. The land on which the um, building sits will be deeded over to the city and the developer will enter into a ground lease um, for up to 10 years for this property. This is in order to enable the um, rebate of the hotel occupancy taxes based on convention use uh, for that. Um, additionally, the downtown TIF has provided $650,000 in funding um, for reimbursement for public improvement costs. Now this building itself does not sit in the downtown TIF, but it abuts it. So the right of way um, that is in the downtown TIF is where these, these improvements will be used, so that's why those fundings were used, Those uh, the funds from downtown were used for the public improvements in that right-of-way that abuts up to the building. So this tax exemption will not be taking away any increment, potential increment, from the downtown TERS. Now staff, um, in order to participate in historic site exemption, what the commissioner's court will do is to find that the property is historically significant and in need of tax exemption to ensure preservation and approve the historic site exemption agreement, which we will come back at a later date and will bring to you. So at this time, staff is recommending exemption of 75% of the added value from the renovation and we would work with the developer um, in the coming weeks to draft an actual historic site tax exemption agreement that would provide we would provide for you for um, your consideration, much like a tax abatement agreement. So we were looking at the fiscal impact. Um, the total appraised value of the building is a little over 23 million right now. That's about 22.7 million improvements and 900,000 for the land value. As I mentioned earlier, the estimated renovation costs for the project are estimated over $36.5 million. And then the land value, once the city has um, ownership of that, will actually become tax exempt. So that would be taking that value off the tax rolls. But based on the improvement costs in our current tax rate in a 10-year 75% um, county and hospital district historic site tax exemption, we are estimated that over the 10-year period combined, it would be about $1.2 million in taxes exempted. Um, I have shown in your staff report um, a chart that shows the added values. We would maintain values at the current tax rate um, in terms of taxes. So that would be about $55,000 a year in taxes for the county that would continue on the tax rolls and about 53000 a year for the hospital district. And then the county would continue to get taxes on the un unexempted, that 25% unexempted portion of the new improvements, as well as any um, taxes on the business personal property because that would not be subject to historic site tax exemption. So I, right now I'd like to um, call up Gary Prosterman. Yes. How many employees? Uh, 30 full-time. I think they're going to have more, and I'll let him address that a little bit, but I think we were looking at how many actual full-time equivalents. Um, obviously, in the hospitality industry, there's going to be a lot more that are um, part-time, so I'll let him address that. Okay. Um, Gary is a managing partner with 714 Maine, and he will provide a little bit more information about the project for you. Uh, 
Uh, hello, thank you, Judge and Commissioners. Um, I'm mainly here to answer questions, but I, I can uh, start, I guess, with a with a brief overview. We go around the country finding underutilized historic buildings that need a new life, need a new use to hopefully revitalize urban cores. In the case of Fort Worth, I would say maintain the momentum because you have so many great things going already in your urban core. Um, but that's really what we focus on doing. We've done other projects in Texas. Uh, we completed one uh, about two years ago in downtown Houston. Um, it is a Lake Meridian hotel. It's also in the convention district in the, in the urban district. Um, what, what I would, uh, I guess the main points I would make, just mainly reiterating some of the things that Lisa has, has mentioned is, you know, this is a tool that exists to encourage companies like us to not only preserve these historic buildings, um, but also to help uh, revitalize um, and, and, and create new jobs. The specific answer to that question, uh, Commissioner, is that we'll actually have about 100 jobs there um, I would say the FTEs are probably closer to 70. You know, when you have, um, in, in the case of a Kempton Hotel, there's a heavy emphasis on also food and beverage. Um, and uh, so you have a lot of part-time workers. Uh, but we will have about 100. Um, the construction jobs will be 200 plus. I think most of you are familiar with the multiplier effect from construction. So it's a, a very, a very significant economic impact uh, built from the construction aspect. Um, the um, other point that I would make is that what most communities have, have experienced is this sh shift to the urban core. I think it's just one more tool um, to make a downtown that much more appealing. And it's just, I've spent a lot of time with Andy Taft, who's your, uh, I guess, executive director of your downtown Fort Worth. And it's just one more tool that helps people like Andy as we try to attract, whether it's residences we're trying to attract, whether it's new employers we're trying to attract. In this particular brand, and the real reason that we're asking for this, um, I, guess, I would call it, I guess it's more of a tax freeze abatement on a portion of the increase, is that it's the type of hotel that is very appealing to downtown Fort Worth and to the and visit Fort Worth as we spend a lot of time with them. Um, and the construction costs are very high for what we're doing, but the rates that we would command in Fort Worth, say relative to other markets, are not quite there. Um, I, I guess the best example, and um, I'm from Memphis, we have a lot of rivalry with Nashville. I'm sure there's a lot of rivalry here, I know with Dallas and Austin, et cetera. But the reality is our construction costs are the same as they would be in Dallas or Austin, but our average nightly rates are a good bit lower. And a good example is there's a Kempton Hotel in downtown Austin, the Van Zant. I don't know if any of you have been there from maybe your travels there, but their average nightly rate is close to $280 per night. And in Fort Worth, we'll be closer to something around $200 per night. And yet our cost to develop it and operate are fairly comparable. So that's that's the reason we're respectfully requesting a portion of the uh, abatement there. Um, one of the things I would want to make sure of is that if you ever decide to condonize some of it or create condos on there, that that would be fully taxable. And talk to me a little bit more because I, I guess I, I may not have listened as well as I should have. You're telling me that the city is going to own the land or the building or something? Yes. So, uh, and, and I'm no expert, so I don't know if anybody here from the city, but I'm going to put it, I guess, in layman's terms as I understand them. Um, and we have a similar program in Houston. In order, the Visit Fort Worth, which is your Convention and Visitors Bureau, in order to encourage hotels of a certain caliber, we'll call them full service four star hotels with meeting space, they offer incentives, which is a portion of your sales tax, the city's sales tax is um, rebated. In our case, it's actually we have 10,000 square feet of meeting space, I think you mentioned 3,000, but we have to have a minimum of 10,000 square feet of meeting space and over 200 rooms. And in order to participate, it's actually a 
through a state program. I, I think it's 505. Is that the? Uh, um, it, it's something like that. Uh, we actually have to deed the land underneath the building to the city of Fort Worth during the term of that 10-year agreement. So the city of Fort Worth will actually own the land and our entity will own the improvements. Just during the abatement period? During the abatement period. At the end of the abatement period, there's a, a buy-sell agreement that we will buy it back from the city of Fort Worth, the underlying land. You, you For, buy it back or just? We buy it back. It back. For a specified amount? Specified amount. And then it goes back on the tax roll? And then it goes back, yes. And again, the land is a small piece. It's 900000 The current tax assessment is 27? About 23. $23 million. 23 million. And the land is 900000 of that. So it is a small component. But yes, that component would be tax exempt during the Does it take up period. a full block? Uh, it does not take a full block. No, it's a probably about a half an acre. Then it's le actually less than that. It's like a quarter. It's like point two four. So point two three two acres. That's all it is. So within that area, then I guess what our abatement is. What are we proposing as the abatement, Lisa? Exemption. Exemption. Um, the exemption would be 75% of the new value. So basically we're going to, in the contract, we're going to freeze taxes so that we are ensured that we get the same amount that's on the tax rolls. So um, now. So and we're going to collect for the land all the time that the city owns the land. Because we're going to set a minimum value so that we freeze it at the current rates, which would include as now the 900000 And so, so then we're going to take what is what they put in and the value for the property, the increased value of the property, we're going to exempt 75%. 75% for a 10-year period. Correct. And, but, we'll, and we will still be collecting taxes on any new um, furniture, fixtures, and equipment that are put on site, business, personal property, because okay. that is not subject to the exemption. Okay. My employment question had more to do with the hospital district's involvement. We been somewhat reluctant to provide incentives to the hospital district unless you have a significantly high percentage of employees who have health insurance. Because if you don't, then those are going those people that don't have health insurance are going to end up at our hospital. So it's kind of a double whammy. Mm -hmm. We're paying you, and you're not paying them their insurance, but we're having to take care of them. So that's, and in the past, we, we've had hotel, semi-hotel users, Deloitte, uh, built a huge campus, which was a hotel out at, in Westlake, Texas. And, they decided to back away from asking us for an abatement because they didn't want to pay insurance on you know, 400 employees that were working in an 800 room, basically an 800 room hotel. So, and I don't know whether you explained to him the difference in the county and the... Commissioner, um when we Am look, I missing something? No, no, you're not. But the size and the scope of this, and yeah. the, it's a little bit different because it's one is a renovation, it's a historic renovation. The size and scope is a little bit different than even from the Omni or from the um, Deloitte project. And um, also because we are reducing, and a lot of the other um, historic exemptions that we've done in the past, we have done 100% exempt, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons why um, staff has backed off and recommended the 75% um, was be because of that. But again, the minimum of 30 was full-time employees that would be covered under um, health insurance, and so the number of employees is not that much greater. I, I think the impact on, it's, it's not the same as 400 employees no. up at Deloitte that are in the hospitality. Let me ask one other question. Now. So I fully understand what we're giving the peer 
You got a $23 million, $25 million base value. Is that yes. somewhere in there? That's correct. We're going to collect 100% of that. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Okay, the, the increment that you're putting into improvements takes that number up into the 50s. 50 million, 55 million. We're going to get, to, we're going to abate or defer, however you want to call it, 20, 75% of that portion. We're not deferring it, we're exempting it. Exempting it. 75% of that portion. But we do collect 25% of Correct. that portion. So we're getting all of 23 and a quarter of what you're adding. Correct. And in addition, as as she pointed out, um, the, we'll have approximately um, approximately eight million dollars of furniture, fixtures, and equipment that is not exempt. So it's definitely an increase over where it has been as an office mm -hmm. building, um, but it it um, it does allow us to do a lot of what you know. There's this. I use you know the yin and yang between what the types of hotels that visit Fort Worth wants to see, and the types of hotels that a developer can build, and you know it takes the tools and the toolkit to try to balance it out I so love that. The project. I think yeah. it looks great. Well, and one of I've heard another uh, hotel developer refer to some of the other hotels as ankle biters. Right. So. I wouldn't use that term, but um, <laughs> but I will say no it is hard. No space, nothing but rooms, yeah, it is so therefore they have a right. they have the best of both worlds. It is very difficult in the it, to um, justify building what we call full service hotels, mm -hmm. and 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 a full service hotels with a lot of buzz is even harder. And the Kempton brand is one that that you know has a lot of appeal. Really, the, something that Visit Fort Worth is very excited about, uh, and but you know, again, to do one, this will be one of the smallest markets where there's been a Kempton, um, and but we're we're thrilled. I mean, we we just we think that Fort Worth is a great community, and we think that uh, the convention center is continuing to grow, and downtown continues to uh, to grow and attract as well. One other question. You promised that was your last one. I know. <laughs> Is the city of Fort Worth involved in any of this? From an yes. abatement standpoint? So the city of Fort Worth actually had granted historic site tax exemption for that building back when um, the, in the additional, the original renovations were done. Mm -hmm. So it's been under historic, 100% historic site exemption um, for some time now. And that will be ending, I think it's either a 10 or 15. I think it was you know, designated as, as historically significant endangered. So I think that gave a 15 year. And I think in the next couple of years, that is going to end. Um, but on the other flip side, that's what they did was grant a um, 380 rebate agreement, an economic development program agreement to provide up to $6 million in, in, in a hotel occupancy taxes rebate. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Was that their yes. lot money or was it zero yes. sales yes. tax? And so that is the reason, because of using that hotel occupancy tax money is the reason because they, it's allowed to give it back to this project as long as it's for convention center in, in you know, support of, and that's why they have to um, take ownership of the property. Okay. I, and I guess my follow-up on his question, Chris, I was going to ask was, have we done an analysis to see, are they, are they giving back, or are they rebating all of the bed tax and all of the sales tax? No, we I don't. would like to see an analysis that shows us how much we're putting in and how much the city of Fort Worth's putting in. Because by the time they, they're going to continue to collect bed tax and they're going to continue to collect sales tax when we're collecting, granted, more tax than what we would if the building stood vacant. But I want to, I'd just like to see an analysis that shows are we in it more than Fort Worth, the same as Fort Worth, or less than Fort Worth? We'll we'll check the math and, and get it, but but in general, um, the 
hotel occupancy tax program or the hot rebate program, it's it's capped at six million dollars with the city um, on, on that piece, uh, and that is over a ten year. That's over a ten year period. I believe that. So are you saying the maximum they're going to rebate back to you is six million? Right, of the new tax coming in, the sales tax coming in, and bed tax. Right, it, it's purely that portion, and <laughs> and that is capped over the ten at ten year period, and it takes about the full ten years. Just you know, we've all done the math based on projections. Somewhere between year nine and ten, we would reach that cap. I believe that you noted the calculation in our case, and correct me if I'm wrong, here is about 1.7? 1 1.2 million. 1.2 million. So it's almost 5 to 1, yeah. almost 5 to 1, the city portion to the county portion. But if you put the hospital district in there, it's now that 2 is, point. That is, that includes that the, is the 1.2. It includes. It's about 600. And, uh, just, let me see, just let me see the numbers on that from that perspective because I... I always like to make sure that you know we're not contributing more than the city is from that standpoint. In any of our agreements that we do, we got 41 cities. So yeah, I understand. So what are you expecting? Is this is just a briefing item. Or Excuse me. When are, yeah, this is a briefing not, item, no, and, and okay. we will be coming back with an agreement and we, with okay. our analysis before we bring it back for consideration of uh, the uh, formal approval. It should be in a, a, a two to three weeks. Any other Sorry. questions about this? No, you all covered all of mine. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited about it. Yeah. About thank, you. thank you. Thank you. You think where we can bring a little bit more meeting space too, and I think uh, hopefully we're getting close to the tearing down the old saddle out of the old. Thank whatever you. that was the end of the convention center. Your Honor, that's all we have at this time. Then we'll recess our open meeting, proceed to close, to discuss items exempt under section 551.071072074076, and avoid. Closed session, there being no business to conduct at this time, we stand adjourned. Thank you.